Hello, Year 10. So this week we are going to be focusing on the power poems. So we've looked at the war cluster. Now we're going to look at the two poems that focus on the theme of power. Although like most of these poems, they have more than one theme. So as we do the poems, we'll be looking at the, those other themes and how we can link them together. So firstly, we're going to recall personification. Can you remember what we mean by personification? And then I'd like you to answer this question. What characteristics would you expect to find if a bird of prey was personified? So a bird of prey means a bird that eats another creature. OK, so not a bird that just eats grain um, or, you know, even worms. But think about, you know, the type of bird of prey that would swoop down from the air and, you know, eat a rat or a mouse, or maybe even a rabbit if it thought it could carry it away. OK, so what sorts of um, personality traits, if you like, that's what we mean by characteristics, would you expect to find if a bird of prey was, was personified? Now, remember, personification is when you are giving human emotions or human personality traits or characteristics to something that isn't human, like, for example, a bird of prey. So you can pause the video and answer that question. So our new word today is an autocrat. Now, an autocrat is a ruler who has absolute power. So think a dictator, for example, might be more familiar to you. But another way of saying that is an autocrat, a ruler who has absolute power. So let's then look back at our question. So think back to an inspector course. How is Mr Burling presented as believing he is an autocrat? How does he believe that he has this sense of power? Now, obviously, he isn't a ruler in the sense that he's not a president or a prime minister or a king. But how is he presented as having those almost autocratic tendencies, that idea, that inflated sense of his own power? And then our final question, what are the personality traits of an autocrat? So from someone that, that was an autocrat or believes themselves to be an autocrat, what personality traits or characteristics would you expect from someone who has that sort of power? So you can pause the video now have a go at answering those questions before I go through my thoughts on them. So a bird of prey could could be personified as vicious, bloodthirsty, cruel, um, lethal, someone who enjoys the act of hunting, we typically don't associate, you know, we wouldn't associate the same characteristics to a cute little robin, you know, that you might see on a Christmas card as you would a hawk or an eagle, for example. So it would probably be quite negative, quite violent um, personality traits that we might think about if we personified a bird of prey. So Mr Burling believes in the sense of his own power, that he has almost these characteristics of an autocrat because he knows he's the head of his own family as it's a patriarchal and male dominated society. He knows that he has power over his own household. We know he is a factory owner and he feels like he holds power over his workers, those women like Eva Smith. We also know that he feels like he holds power within the local community, either through his connections with, say, the Chief Constable Colonel Roberts, whether it's through his the fact that he was Lord Mayor, magistrate. He feels his sense of self is very, his ego is very overinflated because he believes that he has that power. So what personality traits might we expect of an autocrat or a dictator? Now, these, these types of people don't tend to be presented in the most positive ways. We typically see anyone presented as having power, as having abusing that power, using that power for their own gain, rather than using that power to help um, the people that they are supposed to look after or maintain. We might associate selfishness, greed or avarice. Remember, avarice is our fancy word for greed when we were looking at Christmas Carol. 
we might associate a sense of bloodthirstiness or maybe potentially violence, maintaining their power through violence. You know, figures like um, Stalin, Saddam Hussein, Hitler, these famous dictators that we know were known for their, their murderous and their bloodthirsty nature. So hopefully what you, the connection you're beginning to make now is between this idea of, a, of an autocrat and what we associated through the personification of a bird of prey. And you will see in a few minutes time how both of those ideas link to the poem we're going to be studying today. So today we're going to analyse and evaluate how Hughes uses language, form and structure to present the themes of power and nature. They are the two dominant themes in this poem. So by the end of the lesson, you will know who Ted Hughes was and why he wrote Hawk Roosting, the form and structure of the poem, and how Hughes uses language, form and structure to present the themes of power and nature. Remember, in the, antho yeah, the sorry, I can't talk, anthology poetry section of the exam, you will be asked to write about how one of the themes is presented in a poem that you'll be told to write about. And then you will get to choose a poem with a similar theme, or the same theme to compare to that poem you've just written about. So we have to study these poems through those themes and make links and connections between the poems through those themes as well. So we also know by now that we have to write about the context. Who was the poet? How, what were their life experiences? What were their beliefs? And how does that link to the reason why they bothered to write the poem in the first place? And we know that we must include some of this information in whatever answer you make in the exam. So you can choose to make these notes on a separate bit of paper, or if you have your co a copy of the poem in front of you, you might want to write the word context in that little bottom space, as we do in, in my students do, and bullet point some of this information. So Ted Hughes then is a contemporary um, poet, meaning that you know he was writing in the 20th century rather than the 19th or the 18th, um, like many of the other poets in the anthology. So he's something we would consider more of a modern poet. So he was born in West Yorkshire in 1960 and grew up in the countryside. So like the romantic poet, Take William Wordsworth, who wrote the prelude, who was massively influenced by his childhood experiences growing up in the Lake District. And, you know, all of these romantic poets, Shelley, who we're going to look at um, next lesson, we looked at, have looked at Byron, we've looked at Blake writing London. We know how influenced these romantic poets were by nature, by their childhood experiences in nature and the inspiration they took from nature. Now Ted Hughes isn't a romantic poet because he wasn't type, he wasn't part of that movement at the time that was very much an 18th 19th century movement but you can refer to Ted Hughes as a neo-romantic poet. Now neo n-e-o simply means new so you could look at Ted Hughes as a neo-romantic poet a little bit like Seamus Heaney. If you think back to the start of the year, we did Death of a Naturalist, the poem about the little boy that likes to collect frog spawn. And we see his innocent childhood view of nature change as he gets older. And we've got that idea of the loss of innocence. So you could consider Seamus Heaney as another neo new romantic poet because he was very influenced by nature and his childhood experiences in nature, as was Ted Hughes. OK. So he also served in the RAF, the Royal Air, um, Air Force, for two years, although he didn't see a lot of action, to be fair, during those two years. But he would have had the training, you know, and everything. But after two years, he won a scholarship to Cambridge University, which, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is a very prestigious, um, a very important um, university and he studied anthropology and archaeology. Now anthropology is the study of humanity basically the sort of from our evolution from apes to men and everything ever since 
and archaeology is the study of artifacts, of relics that are dug up and found in the earth, which obviously is giving us evidence and information about past cultures. So what we have here with Ted Hughes is the, a combination of his his interest in nature based on his upbringing and he spent you know a lot of his life living in those natural settings a combination of this idea his interest in the study of hum humanity and humans over time and his study of ancient culture as well and all of those things are very much present in his poetry as well so his poetry reflects his interest in connecting the human world, so that world of humanity, to the natural world of you know, animals and nature. And how, how do these two things interact with each other and live side by side, essentially? So he was poet laureate from 1984 to 1998, which is when he died. Now, poet laureate is probably the greatest honour for a poet, a professional poet. You are considered, you know, your nation's best or favourite poet. Um, Simon Armitage, who wrote The Manhunt, is um, also a poet laureate as well. Um, so he had that honour. So in Hawk Roosting, what Ted Hughes does is he imagines what the thought process of a hawk would be if you could read its mind. So if you could know the thoughts of a hawk, what would a hawk, a bird of prey, a predator think about? And that is predominantly what this poem is about. And it is, I know I say this about all of the poems, but this really is my very favourite poem in the whole of the anthology. I think mainly because my my mum is absolutely obsessed with Ted Hughes and his wife, Sylvia Plath. And for those of you that are thinking of maybe studying English at A-level or would like to sort of do some extended reading, I would really recommend you look into Sylvia Plath. You will most certainly do some of her poetry at A-level. Um, she wrote an amazing book called The Bell Jar and was a really, really interesting lady, which I won't talk um, about too much now because it is not massively um, contextually relevant to this poem, but his relationship with, with um, Sylvia Plath, who eventually tragically committed suicide, was both their relationship with one another was really, really um, influential in both of developing both of their poetry. So like I said, if you're thinking of maybe studying English at A-level, you'd like to sort of do open yourself up to um, some different works of literature, do look into Sylvia Plath, um, Plath's poetry and the novel The Bell Jar, which is a very good one. And when we're back in school, I have a copy on my shelf, I believe, in my classroom that I'd be happy to lend any of you. Right, I'm digressing slightly. So form and structure then, and we know, particularly if you're pushing for some of those higher grades, writing about the form and structure of the poem is always going to gain you um, sort of decent marks because it's just more difficult than writing about the effect of language. So form, the poem is written in the form of a dramatic monologue. Those drama students among you may have heard of this before. So a dramatic monologue, um, which is where the poem is written from the thoughts of a character. So it's like you're reading the mind of what that character is thinking in that moment. And in this case, we're reading the mind of a bird of prey, the hawk. The structure of the poem itself, and you can see that by just by looking at it, is very organised, very rigid, which could symbolise, and remember symbolise just means represent, the power and the control that the hawk believes he has. So we're going to pick up on that, that idea of the structure um, mimicking the poem. Remember we talked about um, the technique of mimesis as well previously. Um, we're going to pick up on those things as we annotate the poem. So I am now going to switch over to my visualizer and we are going to annotate the poem together. OK, so we know, as always, we look at the title first. You should hopefully have your contextual information written at the bottom. As always, if you don't have your anthology, you aren't able to print off a copy of the poem, do just make these notes on plain paper and we will copy them over to your anthology when we are back in school. Um, so, Hawk. 
we should automatically think of a hawk. You know, and we should think of this idea of a bird of prey. What do we associate with a bird of prey? They're vicious. bloodthirsty they have to murder to live although interestingly you could apply all of those things to humans of course in fact I'm going to write that down because that becomes relevant to some of the messages here that um, Ted Hughes is trying to uh, give us and remember Ted Hughes wrote poetry looking at the way humans and nature interacted with each other so we're going to talk about the different ways of interpreting this poem as we read it but you know all of those things we associate with a bird of prey you could also apply this to humans which is of course you know this is Hugh's intention and then we have roosting now if you're roosting it's this idea of you know, resting. You know, it gives us this idea of not being concerned or worried, you know, being at ease. So, I sit in the top of the wood. Now you will see as we go, I'm going to underline or circle every personal pronoun in this poem because there's a lot of them. I, me, mine, these are all personal pronouns. So we know that it's written in the first person from the hawk's perspective. Incidentally, no one got back to me to say whether you preferred me annotating the poems like this or doing it on the PowerPoint. I'm happy to do either one, so do please let me know if you have a preference. So I sit at the top of the wood. Now this is really interesting because this idea of, of being at the top gives this idea of superiority and power. It's almost this idea of being at the top of the food chain. You know, I'm at the top of the woods, the top of the hierarchy, the top of the situation. My eyes closed. So if his eyes are closed, he's resting, he's roosting, as we know from the title. He's not worried or concerned. Because of how powerful he thinks he is. I need to be careful, I'm going to run out of room. So his eyes are closed. It's giving this idea of being completely at ease. He feels there is no one out there as powerful as him that could threaten him. And notice how I'm using um, him as this sort of pronoun as well. Now, we've got no idea the gender of this hawk. It is never mentioned. And it's quite interesting that it says something about the bias of our society, that I'm associating a bird of prey instantly to a male pronoun rather than a female or, in fact, a gender neutral one. So that is possibly an interesting conversation for another time. So I will try to refer to the hawk as an it, because we have no idea whether it is a he or not. Although again, all dictators in history have predominantly been um, male, or certainly the more modern famous ones. In action. So he's completely still at ease but I always think when I when I personally visualize this bit of the poem it's almost like there may he may be not moving he may be totally still but it's almost like he's poised ready to pounce ready to swoop down ready to act if he needed to so you know this isn't a, a, this isn't a chilled out personality 
He's not up there, nice and calm, enjoying life. He's resting, but he is still hyper-focused and hyper-aware. So it, again, is almost making him, this idea of inaction is almost making him more intimidating because it's like he is totally ready to act if need be. No falsifying dream between my hooked head and hooked feet. So notice we've got the repetition here. Um, it's showing he's dangerous. They're like his weapons. Um, I would go into YouTube, you know, either pause the video or do it now or do it afterwards and just, you know, YouTube footage of a hawk swooping down and getting its prey. You know, unless seeing possibly an animal getting eaten would be very disturbing for you. If that's the case, then please don't do it. But, you know, if you're interested to see actually what that would look like and to help you visualise the poem, you know, hawks and birds of prey deliberately have hooked beaks, they have hooked claws, so they can be effective predators because again they need to eat to survive it's their nature you know then are they and we'll, we'll be asking ourselves the question when we get to the end of the poem is hughes judging the hawk here or is he in fact just saying well this is the this is just a hawk since they're just it, in any way you can't judge a lion for eating a zebra we can't be negatively associated you know making assumptions about this hawk just because he's a predator too because it's in his nature Therefore, should we not be looking at human beings negatively when they prey on each other because it's in our nature? Again, a debate we potentially have at some point when we're back in the classroom. So this idea of hooked, this repetition of hooked is reminding us of the weapons that of, you know, the fact that the hawk's body is a weapon, essentially, particularly against his prey. Or in sleep rehearse perfect kills and eats so what we can see here is that he dreams of killing so that links into this idea of him being very bloodthirsty but equally what we see here is this idea of perfect you know he's a perfectionist and in many ways this makes him come across as quite arrogant he doesn't just want to kill to live he wants his kill to be perfect you know there's there you can almost this implies that he he cares again look at me saying he again it it cares about the way it is perceived that its kills come across as being perfectly and maybe even beautifully executed here but that's very sinister you know it's giving us a very sinister impression because this isn't just someone that kills because it's in their nature um to eat we've got someone that enjoys they take a lot of enjoyment out of the process of killing so stanza two then the convenience of the high trees so if something is convenient then you know it helps you you're going to sort of look at this verse or stanza together in a minute the air's buoyancy and the sun's rays are of advantage to me so what he's really saying there in these three lines is that nature or natural things so the trees the sun the air exist only for his benefit and advantage so you know we begin now to get this sense of a deluded sense of his own 
power, which is sort of accentuated really by this next line, paper, can't write power. And, you know, we, we might begin to, you know, apply words like dictator to him, autocrats, and my favourite, just because it's fun to say, megalomaniac, hopefully I've spelt this right, mega, I haven't, hang on, megalomaniac, there we go, that's M-E-G-A, by the way, Ooh megalomaniac similar meaning but not all the same you know we know that a dictator and an autocrat are people that have sort of ultimate power a megalomaniac um is basically someone who is almost deluded about this sense of power so if you're deluded then he's not as powerful as he thinks he is and that's what Hughes is beginning to insinuate into this poem now. You know, so what? Trees, the sun that gives life to all of Earth, air, which we all survive on to breathe. These things only exist to benefit you, as if you are the only important being on the Earth. So that's where this idea of a megalomaniac, him being deluded, um, sort of comes from. And then that leads into this next line. And the earth's face upwards for my inspection. Now the word inspection is again giving himself power. Because, you know, whatever type of inspector you are, a police inspector, think of an inspector cause, whether you are an Ofsted inspector, a, you know, house inspector, there's a sense of power and authority um so essentially what he's saying here is he has power over the earth you know the earth's face upward for my inspection so again it's like it's looking up to him linking back into this idea of sitting at the top of the wood and of course by earth we're looking more, you know, widely at this idea of nature here. So we can see how we might begin to link into this concept of him being deluded. You know, what? so you, a, a single hawk, are responsible for inspecting the whole of nature, the whole of earth that's looking up to you for your approval. So, stanza three, my... Feet. Sorry, I said we were going to circle all the pronouns, didn't we? My is another one there. Me. So we can see just how much this hawk is talking about itself here. My feet are locked upon the rough bark. So, you know, this could symbolise... his power over nature or the power he believes he has over nature almost like you know you are the prison prison guard locking nature up you know he has that tight control which is really um insinuated or hinted at through locked so my feet are locked upon a part i can't talk now upon the rough bark and notice the full stop and we see lots and lots and lots of caesura okay there is the occasional piece of enjambment as we can see here there's lots of short statements the, what he believes to be short factual statements okay we've got another little piece of enjambment there mirroring the fact that we have the enjambment there from verse 2 and 3. And we're, we're not going to talk so much about the enjambment of Caesar in this poem. Because I think that's a, that's a conversation to have when we're back in the classroom revising this poem next year. But it's just, you know, particularly those of you that are a little bit more confident. You may well, at the end of this lesson, want to go back and actually think about the effect of, you know, the punctuation, the Caesar and then the enjambment when we've got these lines that run on. 
because again, they're there very deliberately. So my feet are locked upon the rough bark. It took the whole of creation to produce my foot, my each feather. Now, this is interesting here because we have creation with a capital C. So he is referring to nature here, but he's also referring to God. And again, I'm talking God as in the God with a capital G. Now, whether you're talking about the Christian God, culturally, it's more likely, you know, in fact, he's British and the predominant religion um, even now is Christianity and obviously historically it was. So what he's basically saying is it took the whole of God's power to produce my foot, my each feather. So look, my, my, again. So he's saying, you know, God took all his effort in creating me. You know, in his way, in his view, to be perfect. Now I hold creation in my foot or fly up and revolve it all slowly. So we're going to get to that. And obviously this is quite interesting because we have the enjambment here. The way this line is flowing into this next one. So creation, I hold more personal pronouns. Creation in my foot. So he's saying... Now I control God, you know, nature. It's almost saying God made a mistake in making me so powerful and so perfect because now I am the one in control. He made me too perfect. Now I am the one that has seized that control. Or fly up and revolve it all slowly. Now this, I always think, links back to this idea of the Earth's face upward for my inspection. It's almost like he's, you know, surveying his kingdom. Again, slowly, it's really interesting use of language there. It's like he's slow, no one can control him or tell him what to do. So he can just slowly fly around his territory feeling that sense of power and control that he has, like he's inspecting every aspect of nature and creation um, and everything is looking up towards him in the sky or at the top of the tree wanting his approval. I kill where I please because it is all mine. And again, another one of these short, abrupt statements. I kill where I please because it is all mine so he's basically saying I can do what I want when I want even murder it's all mine it belongs to me so I can do what I want to anyone that is in my territory because there is no one that can stop me. There is no one that is more powerful than me. There is no sophistry in my body. So sophistry is like um, a false um, argument or deception. You know, he's saying, I have no need to deceive or lie about anything because who do I have to impress why why would I need to lower myself to trying to make things up or give you false information because I'm so powerful there's no one that can challenge me anyway so you know this is reinforcing his belief in his own superiority you know he wouldn't lie or deceive through false arguments because he's got no one he cares about impression that much 
and again, my body. My manners are tearing off heads, the allotment of death. So again, my um, are tearing off heads. So again, I have violent bloodthirsty imagery. He doesn't just kill because he needs to, he enjoys killing, which has been reinforced at the start. The allotment of death. Now, if you allot something, you know, he's saying he decides who lives and who dies. So again, the ultimate power. You know, if you are Christian or, or religious, any religion really believe that God ultimately controls um, what we do. God controls when we do, when we do die and, you know, when we live. And this is why, particularly in, in Catholicism or if you're Catholic, um, historically that suicide was a sin you know and we talk about that when we look at Romeo and Juliet and they're obviously double suicide at the end and it would have been people they would have been of the Catholic faith at that time now suicide is a sin in the Catholic faith because it is only God's decision when you do when you do or, or don't die so this idea of him saying I am the allotment of death is again this idea of you know almost being godlike in his power for the one path of my flight, so again, is direct through the bones of the living. So we've got more violent imagery here. You know, my flight is direct through the bones of the living. So, you know, to kill an animal, he may well swoop down snap its spine snap its legs with the force of him lifting it up before you know he devours it before he eats it so we're continuing with this this violence of his kills here no arguments assert my right so we can see there's almost not a single line that goes past between we have these personal pronouns so he's saying you know no one can argue against me there is nothing anyone can say or do and this links into these sort of last three lines here the sun is behind me now there are two ways to interpret this number one literally flying in front of the sun so it's like he's silhouetted number two we've got this sense of power or it is more powerful than the sun and again we might link the sun with creation and you know in ancient faith the sun has often again been linked with god think of the ancient egyptian god ra who was always represented by the sun so it's this idea of you know i am the most powerful force on earth the sun is behind me, is almost beneath me. This idea again of him being sort of on top of everything. Nothing has changed since I began. So he's saying here, you know, it's always been like this. Throughout my whole existence, it's always been like this. My eye has permitted no change so he's saying I haven't allowed things to change I am going to keep things like this and again the I he's saying you know I will never allow things to change so you know unless this hawk thinks he's immortal which it probably does if it thinks it's more powerful than god 
nothing will ever change because his power will never change. There is nothing exists that could possibly ever challenge his position. Therefore, this is just how it's going to be forever. This idea of his, his domination. Now, if we look at the whole poem, you can just see all of these circles. You can see this, um, this focus on the hawk itself and the way the hawk only cares about itself as well. And hopefully we can see now this really dominant theme of power. The hawk believes that he or it is all powerful, but that sense of power is deluded because we know this hawk is only a hawk. You are a bird. Of course you cannot have this level of power that you believe you do. Now there are several ways to view this poem. In fact, there are sort of three really. The hawk is just a hawk. And remember Ted Hughes has said, um, you know, Ted Hughes is very obviously imagining if a hawk could reveal its thoughts to us, what would a hawk think? And this is what Ted Hughes thinks a hawk would think about its existence. We're not supposed to necessarily agree. And why would you agree with a bird of prey if you could imagine its thoughts? And, you know, Ted Hughes quite openly has said about this poem that is his intention. His intention is simply to, um, to really use the poem to explore this idea of this bird of prey and its power. However, as always, with the beauty of poetry, we can interpret it however we wish. Another way of viewing this poem is that the hawk symbolises a dictator. Um, and, you know, all of these things that the hawk has revealed about him itself, all of these personality traits are personality traits that you would find with a dictator or, you know, of an aut or an autocrat. And therefore, it is a reflection on humanity or even a commentary you know we as human beings are supposed to recognize our own um, traits as human beings as reflected in this hawk or number three is that the hawk symbolizes death or the power of death. So these are sorts of the different ways really to read the poem. That the hawk could just be a hawk. Ted Hughes could be using the hawk to make a commentary about humanity, particularly autocrats, dictators, and this own deluded sense of, of power, this megalomania that they have. Or equally, the hawk could symbolise the destructive power of death. You know, death comes for us all. So you could be Hitler or Stalin or whatever famous dictator you like, sitting on their throne thinking they're almighty and powerful, but actually you're not almighty and powerful. Because actually what is powerful here is nature. So really, what Ted Hughes could be saying here is nature is powerful not man and this is going to link in really nicely to Ozymandias by Shelley who was a romantic poet that we're going to study in our next lesson so now we have annotated the poem I would like you to do the following write an explanation answering this question how does Hughes present the themes of nature and power in the poem. So you might want to just have a short paragraph, one for nature, one for power. Try to use the noun autocrat in your explanation or, you know, megalomaniac, dictator, some of those words that we've discussed as we're annotating them. Remember, we learn this vocabulary at the start of every single lesson because you need to use it. You need to use it when you write, you need to use it when you speak. Okay, It's really important. And the more you say it, the more you use it, the more it's going to come into your long term memory bank. OK, and it will be this these wealth of words that you can use for the rest of your life, which is why it is so, so important that we learn it. Then I'd like you to have a go at answering um, 
from this next question. Why do you think Hughes chose to write his poem in the form of a dramatic monologue? So why, why make that decision? OK, you can pause the video and have a go at those tasks. So finally, then, our last two questions. So personification, do you find Hughes's personification of the hawk effective? Do you think that was an effective technique to use and explain your answer? And just to reinforce in context our new piece of vocabulary, autocrat, how is the hawk presented as an autocrat in the poem? OK, I hope you enjoyed that poem. Like I said, it is one of my favourites and I will see you tomorrow where we will look at Ozymandias, which is a great one to compare.